Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today for the latest Ask the Expert. Uh, we're so happy that you are tuning in to watch. We had a little technical difficulty today, so this is pre-recorded. Uh, but we still welcome your questions and comments, and we want you to know that we're live in the sense of responding to you, and we hope that you find this to be engaging, even though we're not actually on Facebook Live, and that you'll reach out to us if you have questions or comments. So um, today I, um, I'm welcoming our... Uh, friend and state attorney, Jenica Cassidy. I will get to a little bit more about her in a moment. Um, but first, for those of you who may be joining us for the first time, uh, this is Ask the Expert. And we started doing this at the beginning of the pandemic as a way to highlight local businesses and small business and to disseminate really good information about quality service providers who we've come across in the business. So thank you for joining us. If you know some good people you think we should add to our lineup, please do let us know. We're always looking for great businesses and great contacts. Um, I, uh, I want you to know, if you're watching this, you see us recorded, but we do try to always make this available on Facebook and on YouTube. So if you have trouble finding this information later, you can always reach out to me or Jennifer and we will get you the information that you need. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker. This is Jenica Cassidy. Hi, Jenica. Hi, hello. Thank you for coming to join us today. Um, Jenica is going to talk with us about getting older, asking the tough questions of yourself and your parents. Um, Jenica is an associate at Lurch Early in Bethesda, and she specializes specializes in elder law and estates and trusts. And her expertise which I've been able to witness some of firsthand is with seniors and their families of all income levels. Um, she does both planning for the future and dealing with immediate and unexpected needs. Mm -hmm. Jenica received a recent honor and it's hard to talk about yourself, so I'm gonna talk about her. She was named to the 2021 edition of Maryland Super Lawyers. And um, what I think is really great about this is it's by peer review. So um, there are a few other criteria, but one of the big ones is peer review, and that means that she's well-respected among her peers. And I can say, having worked with her, that it's well-earned. So um, congratulations, Jenica. Jenica lives here locally with um, she and her husband and their favorite pup, and they recently welcomed a new baby, so she's a new mom. So Jenica, congrats on that, too. You've had a really big year. It's been a big year. It's been a crazy year. Yeah, we're, we're so glad you're with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having um, me. Yeah, well, we're happy too. I, I'm actually happy that you haven't been back to work that long so we could get on your schedule. So, <laughs> um, so I'm gonna start like I often do you all with a market update about our DC Metro region, but I'm keeping this one short because I, I just can't wait to share this information with you. Jenica has so much good information to share and I feel like this is just one of the most important topics we could be talking about right now, uh, but first, in the DC metro region, we are still experiencing the spring market, which seems like a strange thing to say when it is 90 plus degrees out and it's late August. Um, but we kind of had our pause button pushed on our spring market because of the pandemic. Um, and now we're in full fledged spring in terms of statistics. So total new contract activity throughout the region for the week of August 16th through the 22nd was up 33.1%. So we tracked six jurisdictions and it was up in five of the six by, and then across the board, 33%. So it's pretty impressive. We compared against the same seven day period last year. Once again, once again, homes are selling much more rapidly than they did this time last year. Um, an average of just 22 days on the market before getting a contract, which is 15 days faster, over two weeks faster than this time last year. Um, so that's all I'm going to say. I want to launch right into talking with Jenica, but if you have more questions about your particular area or an area in which you're interested in, please let me know, and I will be happy to answer any questions or do some research for you. So Jenica, let's get to you. Thanks again for being here. I have now worked with you a couple of times, mm -hmm. um, and I have been really impressed with your level of care and concern for your clients. Um, you have a skill set that I think is in short supply, and, um, and that is listening. You really listen. And uh, there's an adage that we have two ears and one mouth and we should use them in that proportion. And you really do. Um, I, I think there's a delicate balance between um, getting the work done that you were hired to do 
Uh, and, may, and maybe there are add-ons to that as you see needs that maybe people weren't aware of, but also listening and responding compassionately. And I think you do both very well. So um, yeah. I want to applaud you on that. Uh, when the idea of the latest Ask the Expert um, was discussed, uh, and we thought inviting you to join us would be a good idea. Um, we thought elder law is such a hot topic right now. Having lost my dad last year, and then go, going through a diff, you're going through a difficult time in your life, and then you're layering that with a difficult process. Mm -hmm. um, and then sadly, I've had several friends lose people in the past year. I just talked with someone this morning who needs, you know, an estate company, and she's overwhelmed with the stuff and contractors. Um, and uh, I've had several good friends lose their parents, some very recently during COVID. So I can't think of many more important topics than this one that we're discussing today. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to launch right in. What I'm going to do is ask questions and we'll have a great conversation. And then um, at the end, we would normally allow time for questions, but because we're having to record this, we'll just wrap it up the normal way and we can check for questions later and send them along to you if that would be okay. Fantastic. Sounds great. And just real quick, I'm excited to get started, but I just want to mention a quick little disclaimer. Um, we're going to be talking about some legal concepts, but this is in no way intended to be legal advice. Every situation is specific and unique, and this is just in, in general broad terms, as you'll yeah. see. But, um, I just, just need to throw that out there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, you've got to know the particulars to actually sure. give people advice, and that happens when they sign on with you as a client, right? Yeah, exactly, yes. So good general info today, people, and um, it will it will help you get the ball rolling on this really important process. Yes. So um, thank you for saying that. And I think, you know, that, that helps me launch into planning. I think at the core of what you do is planning, whether we're doing planning for ourselves or helping someone we love or care about, um, whether we're the kids or the niece or nephew or – Maybe um, as, as you and I had a case recently, a really good friend helping someone who, who did not have children. Um, so there's a lot to consider and discuss. And sometimes I think the hardest obstacle is to know, you know, how do you start planning? When should you start planning for care needs? And how do you suggest bringing up this topic with someone that you care about? It can be difficult to approach. So if you could get us started there, I think that'd be a great point. Absolutely. Those are two great starting questions. Um, in terms of when to start planning, I like to encourage people as once you turn 18, once you're legally an adult is, um, is the time to start thinking about this stuff. I have clients that are young in their 20s, perhaps they've just starting out with a young family, and then I have clients all the way up into their 90s and, and beyond. Um, so end-of-life conversations are not for end-of-life. They are for long before that. Um, it's important to start to think about these things, although it is, it is a tough topic to think about. Um, none of us really would like to think about it, but it is, it's, it's important to do so to avoid those crisis scenarios down the road. Um, and by thinking about it now and planning in advance, it really is a gift that you're giving to your family and to your loved ones because should something occur down the road, at least they have this in place where they know this is what you would have wanted if you ended up in this situation. So that's, it's, a, it's an incredible gift and you wanna make sure that your wishes are honored and, um, and that, that what you want to do is, is actually put into place. So a former colleague of mine, his name is Charlie Sabatino, he has a great mnemonic for when people ought to revisit their care plans. And, and I'm using care and estate plans interchangeably. But um, so this is assuming that you've already put it into place. But the mnemonic is five Ds. So that um, death of a loved one. And I think Jennifer, in, in interrupting you briefly, Jennifer's got, oh, here we go. Here's a graphic for us. Okay, go ahead. Death of a loved one. Great. Death of a loved one, and this is when to revisit the care plan. Divorce, diagnosis of a serious medical condition, decline, a serious decline in health or mental condition, cognitive, cognitive condition, um, or decade. If nothing, none of these things have happened uh, in the last decade, then go ahead and pull out your documents and take a look at it again and see if they're still up to speed on what you would like to do. Um, That's really good because I think those mnemonics help people. Um, so to have one that, you know, we can remember the five D's and 
for those of you watching, if you ever want us to send you this slide, let us know. We, you know, we're happy to. Um, I called it a slide. I don't even know what to call it—a graphic. But this, this is great because when you should start planning, you said you've got people as as early as their twenties. You know, maybe start at eighteen. You can't start too early. Sure. And I think if, if this year has taught us anything, it's that you never know what's going to happen, right? Exactly. And I think and that leads us into the how do you discuss this with loved ones, which is maybe where you were going. Mm -hmm. But it, in these COVID times that we're all living in, where we're seeing people that we may know, people on TV, they're perhaps they're getting diagnosed, perhaps they're even passing away from, from this. It's, it's an opportunity to begin the conversation. You could ask, what would you want if that situation was to occur to you? Um, and that's sort of, it's an opening to an individual who you, who you love and you care for to see if they have done planning for themselves and if not, what, what they would like to do. Um, really the, the end goal here is to make sure that your wishes are valued. The big thing that is to avoid what's called guardianship. Um, and that is, it's a legal, it's a legal system where the court appoints a guardian, an individual for you to uh, handle your finances, to handle your healthcare decision making, should there come a time when you're no longer able to make and communicate decisions for yourself, you're no longer able to handle your finances. Um, this could be due to perhaps a stroke or a car accident or a diagnosis of dementia, what have you. If you've lost the capacity to do so, a court can appoint someone to make those decisions for you. And it's not always someone that you know. And it's it's tough because they're removing, they're literally stripping these individual rights from you and giving them to someone else. And uh, oftentimes it's expensive. I have a lot of clients that they'll hire me to help them get guardianship over mom who perhaps she had a stroke and ended up in a nursing home. And now mom's gotta pay her bills and no one can access mom's bank account. So what do we do? We gotta go to court. It's legal fees, it's public, it's in front of a judge. It's not something that, that you really want to do. So, to so avoid you're, that, plan ahead. you're going through a stressful time in your life and it gets even more stressful, right? Because okay. like you said, your, your rights are stripped and you've got all these hearings and things that it's, it's a scary thought actually. Um, you had shared with me once and because it might be a question other people have, what is the difference between conservatorship and guardianship? Or is there? These are, these are just terms that guardianship varies by state. And so in Virginia, for example, they use the word conservatorship. It means that they mean the same thing. They're interchangeable. However, in Maryland, we just use the word guardianship. Virginia. Okay. What about DC? Do you know what they do? DC, they do conservatorship as well. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, by the way, uh, Jenica is uh, a licensed attorney in D.C. and Maryland, but she's got colleagues in Virginia, and she can also help through her network of people. If you're watching from another state, she can help us make connections for you. Absolutely. Um, so that was a really good explanation, and I, I had talked with you about this, and then I said to my partner, Wayne, you know, we should talk to your mom about this and make sure – and just classic, he said, oh, I don't even want to think about that day. And yeah. that's why people avoid it, right? And it's so important. So no important. one wants to think about it until you really have to, until you don't have a choice. Yeah. Um, I think it's a strength to be able to talk about it. Really. It is. And it's, it really is a gift to your loved ones by, th by sitting down and thinking about it and taking care of it now. Yeah. So um, you, you helped us with the five Ds. Um, what, what kinds of legal issues and or documents should people be considering putting into place either for themselves or for their loved ones? Um, in terms of documents, we, I can just give a broad approach. There's, a, there's countless documents, but I'm going to just touch on a few big ones. Uh, there's the advanced directive for healthcare. And sometimes this is also called a medical proxy. Perhaps a, you've heard of a living will. Yep. And this is a document that has a few different parts. Um, one of them is that you can designate someone, a trusted individual, to 
to help you to make decisions if you come to a point where you're no longer able to make those decisions on your own. Perhaps you end up in the hospital and you're unable to provide informed consent for a procedure. Uh, it could be a whole host of things. This is someone that the doctor can call that has the legal authority to do so. Um, another part of that, of that advanced directive for healthcare is you can designate in specific situations what you would like to do, how, what sort of care you would like to receive. Should say, for example, you've been diagnosed with a terminal illness and there is no possibility of you recovering uh, despite all medical interventions that could possibly be made. Would you like to have a feeding tube in that scenario? Would you like to receive medicine for pain management? Would you like to, to the, the term is pull the plug, sometimes people like to call this. Um, what sort of things would you like to have done in that scenario if you're not able to make those decisions on your own? Um, and then another part of that advanced directive is you can, you can designate what you would like to, to happen to your organs or to your body. Perhaps you'd like it to be donated to science. There's a whole host of options there um, after you pass away. The organ donor, right? Yes. The second big one is the power of attorney for finances. I'm sure many folks have heard of this already. Um, this is similar to the healthcare advance directive where you can name someone, your agent, to make decisions for you to handle your finances, uh, to access your bank account, to contact your realtor, to do whatever they may need to do should you lose the capacity to do, to do that on your own. Uh, and this can be very broad. It can be any essentially stepping into your shoes financially, or it can be very narrow. It can be just selling real estate or just doing one specific transaction. Um, this is I, I suggest that everyone, regardless of your age, regardless of your situation, have at least these two documents in place. Um, and these two documents, they're legally effective while you're still alive. And you can even make them effective. They won't be effective until you lose capacity. You can make them effective tomorrow if you want, or, or they, your agent can't actually do anything until your doctor certifies that you aren't able to make your decisions on your own. So okay. once, once they're done, then your agent is able to actually act if they need to. And then those documents, they, um, they automatically terminate essentially once you pass away. And then that's where the will comes in. And um, we draft trusts for many folks as well. And I think the discussion of a will versus a trust is perhaps for a later day. I'm happy to answer questions if there are any about that, but um, that's where the will and perhaps irrevocable trust can come in. And then beyond that, there's um, beneficiary designations on life insurance policies, retirement accounts, perhaps uh, payable on death designations on your bank account. These are, uh, these are steps that you can take to manage the distribution of your assets outside of a will. Um, I know I just threw a lot at you, but. No, that's good. No. So the ones for now, just to recap, are the medical directive or sometimes called advanced directive, right? Yep. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. So, all right. Oh yeah, I wanted to hit on this when you, you know, what is a good starting point? So maybe we can wrap it into this um, discussion about get your two things you gotta get, the advanced or medical directive and the power of attorney. Those go into effect when you are at loss of capacity, which a doctor deems and then for later is the payable on death and the will but you you really strongly recommend get these two in place the power of, and Take then the guardianship yeah and, and then if you're just starting the process jenna can i sort of skipped ahead um because the way I, I guess in my mind the way our questions were going but i, I want to touch on a good starting point for getting documents together and what to look for and how to get organized um, if you're taking these steps anyway with the, you know, the power of attorney and so on. This is, that's a great question because I have many clients come to me and they say, let's just use the scenario of mom had a stroke and ended up in the nursing home <clears throat> and mom needs to pay her bills. Mom's unable to do so. Well, I have many clients who they don't even know where to begin in terms of what are mom's assets? What is mom's income? What are her bills? Uh, and so then I have to advise them, 
get your hands on some of her mail if you can or look at tax records. Um, it's it's a, it takes a tremendous amount of time and effort. So a good starting point for managing finances right now is to create a list of assets, all your assets, one document, um, the value, approximate value, and the beneficiary designation if, if it's that type of asset that would have one. Uh, and then another list of your income, where, where is it deposited? How much are you receiving? Is it every month? Is it every quarter? Um, and then a list of debts, and then a fourth list of your online accounts and their corresponding passwords. And I, I suggest that if you don't feel comfortable putting all of that in one document, perhaps you put your list of online accounts and you put it somewhere in your house and then the, pa the corresponding passwords you could put somewhere else. So long as whomever you trust and you want to have that information knows where to go to look for it. And then to put that, all of that into practice is to create those documents that we just discussed. Okay, that's great. Right, so we've, now we've gathered this stuff, even though I went a little out of order, we've gathered this stuff, and now we're putting the power of attorney and the medical directive into play. Correct. Yeah. So you don't wanna just gather, you wanna put your plan into play. Yes, and then the next step, once the documents are done, is don't just hide them in a safe, because then they're essentially ineffective. Um, talk to your whoever you've designated as your agent talk to them about that about the fact that you've named them share with them your wishes maybe perhaps you can give them a copy of the document um, provide a copy of the document to your financial institutions to your bank uh, to your doctor provide a copy of the advance directive um, these are they're meant to be shared with those that you're comfortable sharing them with you know, I'm just thinking in a practical sense for everybody watching, because I always feel like I have to break this stuff down into the simplest denominator, but probably good to have a medical directive copy by your front door. Maybe if you have a, you know, area where you keep mail, it could be at the bottom of that or something where it's very accessible, right? God forbid there's an emergency. Mm -hmm. um, and another thought I had for those of you watching, you know, maybe this is where we take advantage of Google Drive you can give permission to certain people to access certain things, and then you have it if you ever have to pull it up somewhere. Exactly. Would that work, Annika? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Well, those are, those are good. Thanks for the starting points. I've also heard people say, and I know that the millennials don't keep checkbooks anymore, <laughs> but for those who have checkbooks, if you're helping your parent or your great aunt, me, I have a checkbook, um, you know, look at the checkbook because that tells you where people spend their money, right? who helps them, you might be able to find some of the doctors, credit card records certainly would help you with that. So um, that was great information, thank you. And thanks for the graphic, Jennifer. Um, so let's say we're watching, you know, we're with somebody, um, family member, loved one, or maybe ourselves, and um, we can tell they're in decline. And you're concerned, how, how do you know when to bring in help? And then I got a couple questions really. How do you know when to bring in help? If it's you yourself, is it a good idea to go see a doctor and maybe say, I think I'm having some cognitive issues and I think I need your opinion? Because I, I imagine this slips away from people and they don't even realize all the time. Sure. And then the third part of that is resources, community, local resources. You know, where do people turn? Mm -hmm. I hope that wasn't too much. I can go back. No, and well, it, it's tricky because capacity, mental capacity is a continuum. So it's rarely a black and white thing. Oftentimes it's someone may be lucid in the morning and uh, by the evening, by the afternoon, they've got sundowners and they're fading and they've, they're unable to remember and recall what they were able to in the morning. So, and this is an important because in the legal sense, if once one loses their capacity, they lose the ability to provide informed consent to, to, execute those documents that we've been discussing. So all of that decision making has got to be done before you lose capacity. So I would say if you haven't done any of this planning and um, if you get yourself to a neurologist or something and they say you've lost capacity, then you can't do any planning. You could be, perhaps find a lawyer somewhere who's, gonna, who's willing to do it for you, but I wouldn't do it, that for example. So um, it's, if it's- Another reason to do it now. Do it now. Do it now. Get it done. When I have 
when I have clients where we're not sure if there's capacity, if there is capacity concerns and we're not sure one way or the other, I'm not a medical professional. So um, we will oftentimes have them go to a neurologist, which could even be done by their attending physician of someone that they're comfortable seeing uh, who will do an evaluation and, and uh, make that capacity assessment. But then in terms of community resources, there's a whole host of them. Uh, I think this area, especially, we're really fortunate to have a lot of options. I suggest if you're if you're just looking for a, a, a database of sorts, uh, your local your area agency on aging website um, that's has a tremendous amount of resources for transportation, housing. Perhaps you have a neighbor that needs caregiver support. Um, there's the caregivers for. Uh, the caregiver hotline for veterans is great for, for vets. Let me interrupt one second because I think we have a graphic. Oh, here it goes. Sorry. There we go. Yes, these are great. Um, if it's if safety is a concern, if you're worried that someone is at risk of perhaps harming themselves or others, you could uh, you could always call it 911 for a wellness check or there's adult protective services. APS is a good resource there to to uh, make a referral to and they'll they'll do an assessment and they'll they can at least then if there is an issue there and they need to get involved then they're able to get into the resources that way the community um, another one i want to mention is the villages which is a very cool grassroots organization it's volunteer led it's local there's a whole bunch of villages all over the place um, and they support community the goal is to support community members who are aging in place. Um, and so this is, they're building social connections. They have um, volunteer opportunities there. It's really about neighbors supporting neighbors. So That's awesome. Villages. I love that sense of community. And these are great. These are some great resources. I, um, I have a friend named Kay Bransford and I wanted to mention her when we were talking about getting all the documents together and, you know, creating the lists. She's a big proponent of the villages and very active in that in the McLean area. Um, and I, you know, based on what she's told me, it sounds like an awesome outfit. Uh, I was going to mention her too. She's, I'll talk to her about her at the end, but she's got a very, very good resource also for helping people pull together those documents. So I'll, I'll mention her at the end, but she has mentioned the villages and these are some other really. Mm -hmm. Five really minutes is a great one to reference if you're looking, and the American Bar Association Commission on Law and Aging. If you're looking for uh, questions to prompt you to start to think about these topics, um, I would definitely check both of those out. Two great resources. Okay, that's great. Um, well, thank you for those. That's, uh, again, we'll be happy to provide this later if people wanna see it. So, Jenica, what if you're trying to help a person who doesn't have kids or family, um, you and I had a case like this, like what legal consideration should be made? Yes, we did have a case and that was, it was nice to work with you on that one. Fortunately, it was a happy ending, but it was a bit tricky getting to that happy ending. Yeah. <laughs> um, if someone doesn't have any kids, if they, perhaps they don't have any family at all, I would first try to determine if they even want my help. Um, perhaps they're living a lifestyle that you wouldn't agree with, but maybe they don't want your help. Uh, and if they don't, if they don't want your help, but it appears that they're in danger uh, or they're at risk of, of hurting themselves or perhaps someone else may, they're at risk of getting hurt by someone else, determine if it's appropriate to contact APS, Adult Protective Services, and they're well equipped to handle a situation like that if they can't handle their own affairs and there's no one with legal authority to help them to do so, then it may be a situation where there's a need for guardianship. Adult Protective Services, the county, once the county is involved, they can go down that road of guardianship if it's necessary. Um, if they do want my help, then I would help them to reach out to perhaps an elder law attorney who can assess their needs and direct them to the appropriate services to accomplish whatever goals it is they have. Elder law attorneys have large networks of social workers and a whole host of folks who, who can um, help them to get, to get whatever it is that they, need, that they may need. You know, I, that's such a tough one because 
um, if, if they don't have kids or family, and sometimes they have family or friends who might be taking advantage of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen that. I've, I've done some conservatorships in Virginia too, and it's surprising to me how sometimes even if you have family, they're not doing what's in your best interest. And, you know, the individuals in a high risk situation, maybe physically or in terms of people taking advantage of them. So these, these um, elder care resources and um, what's the county resource called again that I always forget the name of it. The, uh, um, oh, when you need to, it was on one of the things that Jennifer put up, but anyway. On aging? Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, the, another thing that I find that happens to people that I'm, I'm hoping you can speak to is they don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. They know they need help, but they don't know where to start. And it's overwhelming. And I find, because of my business, what overwhelms them is their stuff. And we've actually hit on that in other Ask the Experts with organizers, or we've got a woman named Rebecca Rue who has helped several of our clients. But they look at what's around them, and they look at their property, and they go, how do I even get out of here? How do I plan for a place that I don't know where I'm going or what it's going to look like? Mm -hmm. And where do I start? Mm -hmm. So do you have recommendations for when they have to think about selling or dispersing property? Um, because a lot of times either they don't have the family or their family may not be helping them. Yeah. Um, start by breaking it down into long-term goals and short-term goals. Is it, is it a matter of safety is, or need? Um, Oftentimes it's a downsizing situation. Uh, perhaps someone is getting ready to move into assisted living or they need a, a, a skilled level of care that they're not able to receive in the home. Um, I would consider the estate plan. What, it, what is it that they want to leave to their loved ones? Is it the house? Is it something else? Um, and then when selling a house, what you do with the funds and your ownership of title to the property can impact eligibility for public benefits like Medicaid and um, VA. And so Medicaid pays for nursing home long-term care. So if this is something that this individual thinks that they would need in the next five years, I would certainly talk with an elder law professional about that because that can have serious implications on your eligibility. <clears throat> um, Oftentimes, this, you know, it's the, the largest nest egg for many people, and so common to sell and use those funds for the entrance deposit of a, a retirement community. So uh, break it down into long-term goals, short-term goals, and um, the next one to two years, and then, and then five years and beyond. You know, and, and for those of you watching, you can turn to us professionals, and like Jenica said, not only do we have resources in terms of community folks, but we have you know, small businesses who specialize in this kind of thing, like helping you get rid of your things, helping you disperse them, helping you sell them, helping you move them, um, helping you figure out space planning for a new place you're going, mm -hmm. helping you organize records. I know what big one Kay Bransford hits on is what records do you really need? People get all wrapped up in what do I have to keep? I have all this paper. And, and then instead of dealing with it, they stop. And what you really need to do is just plow through and I hate that saying, eat an elephant one bite at a time, but that's the truth. You know, you've got this big overwhelming project and you just chip away at it. You chip away at it. So, yeah. and there are people out there who are well equipped to help. So it's just yeah. you know, connected with, with folks who can connect you with those resources. I think the the client we were both thinking about, you know, you and I had expressed that we, we both, we both had this wish. Uh, he, he sort of endeared himself to us and we both sort of had this wish that he'd have started earlier because it just would have been it was so taxing for him and his loved ones and it would have been a little easier um but that's 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 why we have topics like this to try to encourage people to start earlier yeah. um we i mentioned that that you and i can help people if they need to find someone like you in another part of the country you know maybe their loved one lives in arizona they live here and the loved one's trying to help them. We can help with resources. So I don't want to spend too much time on that because I know we're running out of time. But Jenica, I might be jumping around a little bit, but I know a big one that comes up and actually came up with us in the case of the one we were alluding to is driving. Yes. Um, you know, what legal options are there if someone refuses to give up their license and, and you're an outsider really trying to help and figure that out? For them. I like to refer people to Maryland has a really good resource for Maryland residents and if, even if you're not a Maryland resident and this is an issue for you I suggest taking a look at the Maryland resource guide for aging drivers 
and there's a ton of great information in there. For example, you can hire a driver rehabilitation specialist who can help the family to develop a plan to, tra to trans transition away from driving. Um, the, the local Alzheimer's Association chapters have really great resources with, um, for support groups of those helping to care for people with, who are unable to drive on their own. And there's even an option in Maryland uh, to make a referral to the Maryland MVA medical review process. And that's where if someone has a medical, Amer excuse me, a Maryland uh, driver's license, they can be, you can refer them to, MVA, to the MVA and they'll be contacted and then they'll go through um, a process where they may work with an MVA nurse to evaluate, to, to do a capacity assessment or whatever it is they need to do. And at the very end, they could very well lose their license if it's a, if it's a safety concern, but mm -hmm. it's, it's a nicer way rather than walking in and saying, give me your keys. Yeah. And, and it also takes you out of the, it takes you out of the bad guy role, right? Yes. Yes. So, all right, those are good resources. I'm sure there are equivalents if you're watching this somewhere else in your state, Virginia, DC, other areas. Um, I imagine that's, uh, you know, we've got an aging population. So I imagine that comes up very often. Mm -hmm. So Jenica, as we wrap up here, if you could make one recommendation for somebody today what would it be in terms of getting started in this process either for themselves or for their loved ones or both? I would say sit down, think about your wishes. If you don't know where to begin thinking, pull up that Five Wishes website or the American Bar Association website that we referenced before. Um, think about you know, what would you like to happen should there come a time when you're unable to make and communicate decisions for yourself? Once you have an idea, contact an attorney to put those wishes into effect. And then don't just stop there. Have the hard conversations with your loved ones. Uh, share with them the documents that you've prepared. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I would recommend. And, and we, you know, we heard throughout this from you, list out your goals, big goals, little goals. If you do nothing else today, get that power of attorney and get that medical directive. Yep. Right? So I got some good intel from this and yes. uh, I, I hope our viewers did too. Um, again, Jenica, you can certainly uh, talk with her about helping represent you and these needs or your loved ones. And like we said, she can help you find somebody if it's in a different area. Jennifer and I are always happy to help with resources also. Um, and I think we may want to have Jenica back to talk to us about trusts and wills and estates at another time. I just feel like this is so topical and so important. I mean, literally just this morning, I talked with a woman who just lost her mom and has to put her dad, he's end of life, in a care facility because he has a limited number of days or weeks left. Mm -hmm. And with the details, even though they were pretty well prepared, she is really struggling. And it is, it is not, it is a difficult time under the best of circumstances. So for ourselves, for our peace of mind, for our loved ones, let's make it easier on everybody and uh, get this stuff going. Jenica, you are such a wealth of information. I'm so glad that we could uh, meet with you today and have this really important conversation. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for having me. Anything for you, Anne. Oh, thanks. And by way of reminder, guys, this will be on YouTube and it'll be on our Facebook page so you can access it if you have trouble. Reach out to us. You saw Jenica's contact information a few seconds ago. We'll always make it available to you and connect you with her if you'd like. You can send us questions or comments. We're happy to answer them. We love hearing from you. Um, so uh, if you've got other topics you want to hear about, please let us know. And if you need to talk with a local expert about real estate, I happen to know a good one. And uh, I'd be happy to talk with you about your own um, needs uh, about real estate. And if, if you've got, uh, if you're from another area and you need a referral to a realtor, I can help you with that also. Um, in two, uh, three weeks, excuse me, because of Labor Day, we are not meeting on the, is that the 8th or the 9th? The 8th. We're going to go a week beyond that. So we're going to do Ask the Expert again in three weeks on the 15th. And we are going to have Kay Bransford. I mentioned her earlier, but I thought she'd be a great follow-up to our meeting today with Jenica. Kay um, is an author and a coach of sorts. And she created a product called the Memory Bank, 
Um, her own story is very interesting, but both of her parents suffered from dementia at the same time. And Kay developed a tool, um, much like what Jenica was talking about, that started out with lists, uh, gathering information. And it was everything from financial documents to who mows mom and dad's lawn, um, who, who's their realtor, who cleans the gutters, to what are their medical allergies, um, you know, where do they have their retirement plans, what are their passwords. So it's a, it's a great resource. Kay is a really good uh, follow on to this discussion. And I hope you can join us in three weeks for our next Ask the Expert at 1 p.m. Thank you again for tuning in. And don't keep us a secret. Please share this information. Send along the link to your family, friends, and loved ones. And most of all, uh, speaking from sad experience, I hope you got something out of this and that you'll take action for yourself and your loved ones. So thanks again for joining us. And thanks, Jenica. And thanks, Jennifer, for pulling the strings behind the scenes. You're our, yeah. our Wizard of Oz. So <laughs> bye, everyone. Bye-bye.